Well, if we haven't met, my name is Steve Armanderas. I'm one of the assistant pastors here at the church, and uh, I'm always blessed when Pastor Bob asks if I would uh, share the word. And uh, um, I know Pastor Bob's looking forward to being back with us next week. He took a little time off. Uh, you know, the group went on the cruise, and you think, oh, he's been on a cruise. How cool is that? Well, it's a working trip for Pastor Bob. He's teaching and preaching at all these different sites, and so he loves to fly fish, loves to be up in the, in the mountains. He was up in the Sierras this week and uh, doing some fishing, and uh, you know he'll look forward to being back with us. So uh, if you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going through a summer series. The ushers are in the aisle. You need one of these, so if you don't have it, you left it at home or in the car, raise your hand, they'd be happy to give you one. And if they give you one, you open to page 1356 and you're there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, my Bible won't help you, it's 1039 in mine. Uh, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we go through this series in the book of 1 Thessalonians, imminent. Father, this morning, as we open your word, we would pray in the name of Jesus that you would open our hearts. Lord, that as we hear your word taught this morning, that we would hear not my voice, Lord, but the voice of truth, Lord, your voice, which your word is, your truth. And Lord, may your truth be received. Lord, may it be believed. May it inspire us in the life that you have for each of us. Lord, we commit this time to you. We pray that Jesus would be praised. We bless you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to look this morning at verses 13 through 16, and we begin in verse 13, and it says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. What an amazing verse that is, and we will unpack it here later this morning. Verse 14, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea and Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Interesting here that wherever the word of the Lord is preached, there was great suffering. And here, the Apostle Paul, speaking to the church in Thessalonica, says to them, hey, what is happening here with you? And Pastor Bob taught last week of the suffering that they were experiencing, the persecution, the difficulty, and the hardship was happening wherever this message went forth. And in Judea, Judea, the most religious nation in the history of the world, as Paul and the apostles were preaching there, what happened? There was great opposition, there was suffering, there was persecution. They would forbid them to speak the word in a religious nation. And look at verse two of chapter two. But even after we had suffered before, we were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Whether in Judea, the most religious nation in the world, or in Philippi, a pagan nation, which is really known in history where all of the Roman soldiers, many of them, after they retired, they were given land grants in Philippi. So they were very staunch supporters of Rome and Caesar and, and worship of him. And whether you're in the most religious nation in the world or the most pagan nation, and now here, even in Thessalonica, verse 14 says, you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea and Christ Jesus, for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Judeans. 
So whether you're in the most religious nation in the world in Judea, or in Philippi, or here in Thessalonica, which, by the way, was very much like San Diego. It was a beach town. People living the good life. It was very prosperous, very politically active and, and motivated and cultural center and a, a amazing development that was taking place. It was the largest city in that region. And no matter where the message was proclaimed, there was great opposition. Great opposition. And so in the face of this opposition, what would motivate Paul and what inspired him and what was it that he did? And if you turn to Acts chapter 17, we know that the church was birthed in this region through Paul in just three weeks' time. And we read there in Thessalonica in verse 1, in, in verse 2, Acts 17, verse 2, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them. Where's he at? He's in Thessalonica. And for three Sabbaths, that's three Saturdays, three weeks, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob and set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. In three weeks, they turned Thessalonica upside down. But they had a reputation of not just turning Thessalonica upside down, the world. These guys have turned the world upside down. And so they're suffering, they're being persecuted, they're being opposed, and what was it that brought this great opposition on? Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter two. And in verse two, we see but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Now, you've heard some people say, I'd rather see a sermon any day than hear one. And others have said, we're to preach the gospel at all times and sometimes use words. And I think that we have taken that line of thinking to the extreme of saying, yeah, we're just to live it, but we ain't supposed to speak it. But here we see in verse 2 that there in Philippi, they spoke the gospel, and speaking the gospel brought much conflict. Look at verse 4. But as we have been improved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. What did they do there? They spoke the gospel. And what does the Bible say speaking the gospel does? It pleases God. And then again in verse eight, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us with a passion, with an, just a, a commitment that even if it cost them their lives, they were going to impart the gospel as well as their own lives. And again in verse nine, for you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil, laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. It was spoken, it was spoken, it was imparted, it was proclaimed. And that is what brought on this opposition and this suffering and this persecution because that message being proclaimed was like the nails on the chalkboard in the hearing. Whether you were in the most religious nation in the world, Judea, or you were in a pagan place like Philippi and power and might and might is right, or in a successful, wealthy, laid back beach town, the message had the same impact. 
and it brought great opposition. Well, what would inspire someone to persevere through such great opposition, through such great difficulty, great hardship? What was their motive? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. In verse 9 it says, For they themselves declare contrary uh, concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serving the living and the true God. Thessalonica was a pagan place. They worshipped idols. They worshipped all kinds of wacky stuff. Verse 10, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. They were waiting. They were waiting. You see, we have this idea of waiting as like sit back, take a nap. It's going to be a while. But the waiting, the idea of waiting in the Bible is completely different. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, it tells us, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Okay, what does it mean to wait on the Lord? To be able to do all of these things. In our view, wait. You call someone, we're supposed to meet at 8. I'm not going to be there till 8.30. You've got to wait. You hit the snooze button, we've got time, but wait in a biblical context is different. It's like the sprinters running the 100 in the Rio Olympics. And on your mark, get set. And what are you waiting for in that moment? Why? Because the race could be lost before it even starts if you don't get the right start. And that's what he's saying there. And to wait, in verse 10, for his son from heaven. There was an urgency, there was a passion that at any moment, at any time, Jesus was coming back. He's coming again. Are you ready? Not wait, sleep. It might be a year or two years or five years or ten years. It could be at any moment. And that motivated them. And not only that, he's coming back, but for those who don't know him, what does the end of verse 10 say? say, Even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. For those who would die without Christ, for those who would be alive when Christ returns and don't have a relationship with him, it's not a good day. It's a day of wrath. It's a day of judgment. It's a day of punishment. And this inspired Paul that no matter what opposition he faced, he was going to proclaim the truth of the gospel, he was going to speak it, he was going to live it, but he was gonna proclaim it, he was going to preach it with a passion, with a desire, why? Because the gun was up. And we're to be in the blocks, waiting, anticipating at any moment of any day. In fact, the word imminent, what does it mean? It means ready to take place, happening soon. None of us know what a day holds. And with an urgency and with a passion in three weeks, proclaiming, preaching, speaking the word of the Lord, a city was turned upside down. A year ago, many of you know the story. Uh, Sarah and I have four kids, and our oldest is 22. She's back in D.C. We have a son who's 20, a son who's 17, and our youngest son, Josiah, he's had health issues his entire life. And a year ago last night, he had been in ICU at Children's Hospital for for 24 days. He had a rare seizure disorder. He had, uh, you know, been in and out of hospitals his whole life. Couldn't walk, couldn't talk, cortical blindness. What a blessing our son is and was and is for eternity. And so he had been there in Children's for 24 days and... The doctor, I remember when he came in, said, 99% he's going home. 1%, well, that's God. And my wife and I looked at each other and we said, I think he's got his math wrong. It's all God. God has ordained every one of your days, my days, your days, his days. Every one of them have been numbered before there was even a single one of them, the Bible tells us. 
And so the doctors and all the tests say he's getting better, he's getting better, but Sarah and I, just in our heart, just felt differently about this. And it was on August 10th, 2018, a year ago yesterday, and Sarah was tired. I said, you know what, you need to go home. You get some sleep, I'll, I'll stay here tonight, and I'm there at Children's. And I opened God's word, and I read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, and though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, or he was completed. He completed his mission through the things that he suffered, and certainly it's speaking of Jesus there in Hebrews chapter 5, and having been perfected, having been completed, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And you may think this is weird, but I am telling you that God clearly spoke to me that night that it was my son's time. And I knew that he was about to go to heaven. And that next morning, August 11th, 2018, 81118, a year ago from today, at about exactly this time, I'm there in his room. And Sarah had come back early that morning and they were doing some treatments on him and she had gone down the corridor to get a walk to keep sanity because it's always a crazy place there in ICU at Children's. And as the respiratory therapist is doing some treatment on his lungs, he desatted to a number I'd never seen him desat to before. And obviously they go and they hit the button on the wall and it's code blue and everyone comes running and the therapist is looking at me and I said, it's okay. It's his time. And he looks at me and he's like, what? I said, it's okay. It's his time. God spoke to me the night before that it was my son's time. A year ago today, I don't know when your time is. God knows when your time is. And some of us think we have all the time in the world to get things right. And I'm telling you, do not put off till tomorrow what God would want you to embrace today. And I'm blessed that eight days shy of his 15th birthday, 5,467 days of life, Josiah went to heaven. And I shared with my kids this morning, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. Josiah knows a whole lot about heaven. And that's our focus, and that's our hope. And it was that hope and that passion and that understanding that inspired Paul to just say, hey, they might kill me, but... I'm going to share with you a message, and it's the only message in this world that matters. And the one thing I remember telling my kids after our son passed, I have amazing kids. They're talented. They're very, very smart. Thank God for Sarah. <laughs> and I told them, I said, guys, it does not matter what you accomplish in your life. The only thing that matters is if you know Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that matters. That is the only thing that is eternal. That is the only thing that lasts forever. And that captured the Apostle Paul and it motivated the Apostle Paul and that is what inspired him to live the life that he lived. A couple of weeks ago, we were blessed to have Brad Buser here, our missionary from Papua New Guinea. If, if you missed it, go online and listen to it. And man, oh man, was that like a hard-hitting deal and he was like saying hey it's not about short term missions it's about a lifetime calling and I had several guys after church Saturday night Sunday mornings gals too say whew I am so glad that he said oh, that you had to be under 40 to go <laughs> praise the Lord as if we were off the hook I don't have to go to the jungles and get eaten by mosquitoes and all those crazy things. As if, and you know, he's clear, and you know, the, the gospel, the call to preach the gospel to every tribe, tongue, nation, and, and 
We should see the Bible interpreted into every tribal dialect. 3,100 languages that don't have the gospel in their own language yet and inspiration, encouragement. So give your life, dedicate it to bring that truth to some people. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm under, I'm over 40, I can't go. Bummer. As if we are excused. We are not excused. God has a desire for us to proclaim that truth. What was going on? Crazy. There was a war that was going on. Look at verse 16 of chapter 2. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. Our culture today, just like 2,000 years ago, holds sway. Don't tell me that garbage. Don't tell me that stuff. We live in postmodern culture. You hear that word a lot. Postmodernism, what does it mean? I will tell you, you need to know what it means because it is the ethos, it is the culture of every college campus in this country and around the world for that matter. Postmodernism is the culture that has shaped corporate America. It shapes every aspect of our world and many people, especially Christians, don't understand. And other people, they just use postmodernism as post-Christian. And postmodernism 101, just here are the basics of what postmodernism, which holds sway in our culture today more than any other philosophy or understanding, says this. Church and religion historically were the source of truth and meaning, but it failed. Now, I totally disagree with that statement, but if from a, a, a non-believer's perspective, you look at church history and there's a lot of blemishes and things that have been done in the name of God that had nothing to do with God. So I understand why people would think that. But to make that big, huge generalization, church and religion that were the only source of truth and meaning for so many for a long time have completely failed. And then the next tenet of postmodernism would say, science and reason that replaced religion and church as being the source of truth and meaning have also failed. Look at the wars. Look at the poverty. Look at the pollution that science and reason have left us with. And so essentially, what postmodernism would want the world to believe is this, there is no truth anywhere, so make up your own truth. You get to write the rules of your life. It's called nihilism. And so nothing matters. So whatever you want to do, do it. Whatever feels right to you, do it. Whatever you feel like, do it. There is no truth. There is no absolutes. And so what does that leave us with? It leaves us with a culture and a generation that has no hope in anything bigger than themselves. And they look within, and there's emptiness and brokenness. And so for many, it's become a really good option just to end it all. And suicide is at a rampant clip in our culture, in our society. It is a fruit of postmodernism. There is no truth anywhere, so make up your own truth. But guys, I just, and, and so the reason why, just like they, shh, don't tell us, don't, we don't, shush. They forbade us to speak, there in verse 16, that they might be saved. I don't want to hear it. Culture today has done the exact same thing to us, forbidden to speak, but you need to understand this, guys. Postmodernism is not postmodernism, it's pre-modernism. Way back in the garden, God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat of it, what? You will surely die. And what did the devil do? Shh! Don't listen to that. Don't listen to that word. For God knows, 
First thing he questioned, did God really say? Question the word of God. That's what postmodernism does. It's pre-modernism, it's the devil, it's from the devil right there in the beginning. He denies the word of God, you won't die. And then he replaces the word of God. You yourself can be God, knowing good and evil. You don't need God. You're the captain of your own ship. It's not postmodernism. It's pre-modernism. And it's pre-modernism or postmodernism that silenced the word of God 2,000 years ago that is silencing the word of God in our culture and our world today. And it tried to silence the word of God in the Garden of Eden. It's nothing new. It is nothing new. And so who are you taking your orders from? God. The light of the world came in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, in the incarnation. And for those of us who put our faith, our trust in him, he has put his light, his truth in us, and he calls us to be the light of the world. But our culture has turned the light of the church off, making no accommodation for it. And so we say, okay, I don't want to offend anyone. Just kind of want to fit in. Don't want to make any waves. Don't want to make any ruffles. And what happens when the lighthouse fails to be the lighthouse? That's what happens. And there's only destruction. And I'm not sure what happened there if the lighthouse was broken or, or, or what, but it wasn't good. And that ship looks like a nice landing, right? No. It's done. And that's what's happening in our world when the lighthouse fails to do its job and when things don't continue to work. But we need to man the lighthouse. We have a shot of a guy in the lighthouse. This is a classic picture. You've seen that before. I love that picture. And the storms are crashing all around and Who'd want to be out there? It's kind of scary and it's kind of crazy and sometimes I feel like I'm all alone, but how grateful any ship passing by were to see that lighthouse. Guys, that is who you and I are called to be in this generation and we will not see the world change until we stop caring about what the world thinks about us personally and only live for what Jesus thinks. Be the lighthouse. It's an imminent wait. Keep the light burning. At any moment, he's coming back. At any moment, it can be, it can happen today. At any moment. Am I being the light? Be the lighthouse. Philippi, Judea, Thessalonica, they didn't mind you at all until you started shining the light in their eyes. God's word addresses this situation unequivocally in James chapter four, verse four. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Well, I wanna let the world know that it's okay, you can be cool and be a Christian and be friends and whatnot. Yes, be a friend to people, but don't be the friend that is participating and partaking of the sin. Be a friend, lovingly, truthfully, carefully, respectfully love them and be involved in people's lives, but don't be taken down with them. Share the love of God, share the truth of the gospel. We need to stop looking for ways to make broader the narrow road. Jesus said straight is the road, narrow is the gate that leads to life everlasting and Jesus himself claimed exclusivity on salvation and the author and the finisher of our faith, the only giver of eternal life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Postmodernism would want you and I to believe that no one is interested, that no one cares, don't waste your time. Shush! Turn the light off. You're hurting our eyes. Getting ready to head out of town, do a little fly fishing up in Idaho. I'm really excited to go. I need to go. Go visit my brother who's up there and some great friends from the church are up there. So I want to make sure my car's in shape. So Thursday I take it up to 
the place where I have my car serviced. And, and it's always a long wait, but they always do a great job, and so I don't mind waiting. And I'm sitting there, and I've got my Bible open, and I'm just sitting in the chair, and I'm just w- reading, and I'm actually studying to preach this weekend. And there's this young gal sitting in there, not far from me, and she just looks at me with a funny look on her face, and she says, are you reading the Bible? Like, and I'm like, yeah. And uh, she said, really? It's like shocked that people still read it. I said, yeah. I said, have you ever read it? Never. She's probably in her, you know, mid-20s. And I said, you've never read the Bible in your whole life? Nope. And we started talking. You ever go to church? Yeah, I go to church. Sometimes. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Have you, you've, you've never read the Bible, ever? She said, no. And I just felt led by the Holy Spirit to turn to a certain passage, and I just turned there and I just said well would you read this and she read it and immediately she started crying she's like how did you know I said God knows because the word of God is living and active it's not a dead book it is the word of God and it will speak to your life about what's going on in your life right now. Oh my gosh, I just took a test for a job and da 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 and I don't know how I did it, da 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 And this is telling me that God knows everything and to trust in Him. And I went to another passage and her jaw goes wider again. And I shared four passages with her and she was like, oh my gosh, God is speaking to me. And I said, yes, that's what this book is. And as much as the world would want you to believe, shh, Guys, this is our source of life, and in three weeks, it turned a city upside down, and in just a few years, it turned a completely pagan, dead, desolate world upside down, and you and I, as the church of Jesus Christ, are to be the lighthouse in this world, because ships are crashing into the rocks every single day, and I don't know how much time we have left, because it is imminent. And this is what 1 Thessalonians is all about. Let's not forget that the wrath of God rests upon those who reject Jesus. I love what 1 John chapter 3 says, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. If I'm a Christian and I have this hope, it should make a difference in how I live. An imminent weight makes a difference in how we are to live our life. And sadly for many, they, okay, I've received God's forgiveness. I believe that he loves me. I believe he died on the cross for my sins, but you're living the exact same life you were living before you came to Christ. You're still compromising in sexual sin, sleeping around with people you're not married to. You're dating, you just gotta try it out, make sure it's a good fit and everything works out okay. That's not purifying yourself, that's not living, yeah. I can go party, I can do everything that I used to do back in the day because, you know, I want my friends to see that you could be cool and be a Christian too. God desires that we would be the light and be different and become children of God. My kids tell me that undeniably, I am my dad's son. Dad, 
you're starting to look more like Grandpa. <laughs> that wasn't an encouragement. He's 79 now. <laughs> you talk like him too, and your jokes are kind of similar. And <laughs> You know, I love my dad. Thankfully, I don't have his ears. <laughs> I love my dad. And, you know, a child ought to look like their father. And for some, that's a good thing. And for others, I know maybe it is not so much a good thing, but I just want you to know that if you know Jesus Christ, you are a child of God, and God desires that the life that we live would begin to look like our Heavenly Father. Amen. We ought to be more like Him. And that nature, His nature in us by the Holy Spirit changes who we are and what we do and what we say. And that's why John the Baptist, as Jesus was preparing to come and begin his earthly ministry, what happened? God sent him before his face and he proclaimed, repent. Change your ways. Get ready. Why? The light of the world is coming. And you want to get right. You want to be ready. You want to be prepared. He's coming. In Romans chapter 10, verse 14, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring good tidings, glad tidings of good things. But they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. An imminent wait makes a difference in what we speak. And if you know Jesus Christ, God desires that you would be a person who speaks the gospel as well as lives it. What would you see turned upside down in three weeks if you would only speak the gospel. Our world needs to be turned upside down again. And God wants to use men and women sitting in this church before he comes back to take us home. Am I yielded? Am I available? Am I equipped? Study to show yourself approved of God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be ready in season and out of season at any moment of any day because you never know when the girl at the car shop's gonna ask what you're reading to give an answer for the reason for the hope that is within you. There are people all around us who are hurting, who are searching, who are seeking, who are thinking about taking their life, who have lost all hope because our culture and our society, inspired by the devil himself, has lied to us and said there is no hope and there is no purpose and there is no meaning. And now, like never before, the church, as it has throughout history, can shine the light and the hope of Jesus Christ because that is our hope. And so, I said we'd come back to verse 13. Aren't you glad Pastor Bob only gave me four verses to talk about? <laughs> First Thessalonians 2, verse 13, it says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Interesting words there. The first word, you receive the word of God, and that's the word where you just, you hear it, and you think about it. Hmm. And I know people who come to church here all the time, and I talk to them, they say, yeah, I really like the message. Pastor Bob's very energetic, and very practical, and I love his stories, and I love He's a great communicator, and he is. And you can receive it, you can hear it, and you could think about it, and, and I've heard guys, oh, the, the message really helped me in my business, it really helped me with my kids, it really helped me in my marriage. And, but it's not enough just to come and to sit and to hear. 
But there's the word that he used, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And the word there for welcomed it is not just to hear it with your ears, but it actually means to take it into one's heart. It actually is the same word used when someone is welcomed into the family. And maybe you're here and you've, you hear it and you're like, ah, yeah, I think it's, you know, yeah, okay, it is what it is. But have you welcomed it into your heart? Have you made this your own? Have, has the word of God become your family? You welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Wow. You know, when you take the word of God in, it has an effect. And that's what it says there, which also effectively works in you who believe. Love that word. It's the word energeo in the Greek. And what does it mean? To put forth power, to be operative, to work, to work effectually, to be effectual. It's one thing to hear it, but when you take it into your heart, you believe in the word of God, there is a transformation that takes place in your life. The word of God now begins to affect you and one of the things that happens is it changes what you live for. And it gives you energy and it inspires you and directs you and guides you. But if I'm not taking the word in and not believing what the word says, it's not going to have the impact or effect on me. Hmm. All scripture, the Bible says, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, many believe that the Bible contains the word of God Notice I said contains the word of God. But when you believe that the Bible contains the word of God, then it sometimes gives us permission to choose the parts that we like and to ignore those that we might think are inconvenient. But all scripture is given by inspiration. Literally what that means is God breathed. Every word of this book is inspired by God, is breathed by God, and is living, and it's active, and it's powerful. And when you take it in, and you bring it into your heart, and you receive it, and you believe it, it will have an effect on you. It'll change why you live. It'll change what you live for. It'll change the things that you want to entertain yourself with. It'll change the focus and the priority and the passion of your life. And some of you know that and you're afraid to do that because you're having way too much fun being in charge yourself. But I will tell you that your best life is not the life that you control. Your best life is the life that you yield to God and say, God, live your best life in me and through me. And that's when life becomes exciting. And that's when you see the world changed and you will not see your world changed until you yield to the word of God, the authority of God, the inspiration of God, and you come to this book, you come to church on Sunday, you open the Bible on Monday morning and Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday afternoon and Thursday evening and Friday, and you come to it as the living word of God that wants to speak to your heart and inspire you and direct you and make the choices and decisions that you make really simple. Just do what God tells you to do. It's called obedience. And we keep going about it in our own way. And why isn't this working out? And why am I having trouble in my marriage? And why is my business not doing what it ought to be doing? And all of these different things. There's a way, the Bible says, it seems right to a man, but the end thereof leads to death or destruction. 
My people perish, the Bible says. Why? For lack of knowledge. And so many of us have been a follower of Christ, and gosh, it's just like one, well, nothing's working, nothing's going. Have I submitted, surrendered, yielded, and said, God, you are the source of my truth. And I'm no longer going to pick and choose what I like out of the word. I'm going to learn it, and it is going to be what shapes me. And it is going to be what inspires me. It is going to be what ignites me and what I live for. And I'm going to believe it. I'm going to trust it. And that is what it says. It's not the word of men. It is, in truth, the word of God, the inspired word of God, which also energizes the works in you who believe who have faith. And we come to God in faith. In John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, verse 12, says really along the same lines, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Have I received him? Have I believed in his name? Not born of flesh. There are so many people today that I talk to, and our, I don't know, you've probably noticed, our community and even our church is becoming a melting pot. We have people from all over the world. And I talk to people from all over the world. And where are you from? Oh, I'm from Germany. You're a Christian? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Germany's a Christian country. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from India. I'm a Hindu because all of India is Hindu. I'm Buddhist. I come from this part of Asia. I'm Muslim. I come from an Arab country, the Middle East. I'm an American and I'm Christian. Some boastfully say. But we need to understand that in the view of God and the vision of God, this is not something, you're, it's not about your nationality. It is not about your heritage. It tells us there in John who were born not of blood. You may have been born in an Islamic country. You may have been born in a Buddhist country. You may have been born in a Hindu country. You may have been born in a Christian country, if there is such a thing. But in God's sight, it's not your blood that makes you who you are. It's his blood that makes you who you are as a child of God. And it is not born of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh. All right, I'm convinced. I want it. I'm going to become a Christian. Well, you could try that in your own flesh, but here the Bible tells us it is, we are not born of the will of the flesh. The Bible tells us that the natural, fallen, sinful man desires nothing of God. Not of the will of man. The Bible tells us that the depravity of man is so significant, so severe, that the fallen will of man, even the free will that we have, is actually a slave of the devil. I'm not saying, these aren't my words, this is what God's word says. And so you might have been born in a certain country, that doesn't make you what that religion is. You may want to go to heaven and be a good person, but you can want that and try to be good all you want, it, you'll never be good enough we have to be born of God. And how is it that I'm born of God? I'm born of God when I hear the good news. And if there's good news, there's bad news. Because of our sin, the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon all of those who've rejected God. The good news is God sent his son, Jesus Christ, God himself, to live a perfect life, sinless, never once sinned, never once failed, never once lusted, never got drunk, never did any of those things. He lived a perfect life. And the wages of sin is death, and he should have never had to die because he never sinned, but he took upon himself my sin and your sin when he hung on the cross. 
And he died, not for his sin, but for my sin and for your sin, for the sins of the world, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the good news. That's the gospel that Paul went and proclaimed in Judea and in Philippi and in Thessalonica. And that's what some people got so outraged. Shut up, turn the light out. We don't want it. We forbid you to speak. We're going to throw you. We're going to beat you. Why? Because they didn't want to hear it. But some did. And as many as received, you died in my place. And believed, you are my king and my God. I receive your grace, your forgiveness. I invite you into my heart. Be my family. Welcome to the family of God. It says, those who are born of God. And it literally means born from above. And when you receive his forgiveness and when you believe in what he did on your behalf and you welcome him into your heart, literally heaven, the spirit of God, is born in you. And that's the gospel. Not of blood or the will of the flesh or of the will of man. Born of God, God saved you from the penalty of sin. When he died on the cross, do you believe? Have you received? Is God stirring your heart today? Do you know that he loves you? Have you received his sacrificial death for your sin so that you can be forgiven? The worship team is going to come now. And before we dismiss this morning, I just wonder if there's anyone here who has not yet given their life to Jesus Christ. God is not willing that any should perish but that all would come to repentance. The world doesn't want you to hear this message, but God sent his son to die so that you could hear this message. And if you were the only one, he would have done it. And this is not bad news, it's The gospel, it literally means the good news. It's not just good, it's great. And so, Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And I would pray right now, Lord God, if there's anyone here that would just acknowledge and just say, man, I have not received. I've heard it. I've not received the forgiveness of God for my sins. I've not believe that he died in my place. But I hear his word this morning speaking to my heart and telling me this is what I need. And if that's you this morning, you want to receive the forgiveness of God. You want to invite Jesus Christ into your family. More than that, he's calling you into his family. If you feel his call, you hear his voice calling you this morning, and you want to accept his invitation to join his family, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but born of God, I would ask that you would raise your hand. We want to pray for you. This morning, if you want to invite Jesus Christ You want to receive his forgiveness, his love, his grace. If that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer. Just raise your hand. Lord, I need you. Lord, I want to receive your forgiveness, your grace, your love. Maybe you feel a wrestling, a struggle going on in your life. This is what has been missing in your life. You know you need Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you raise your hand? The second call I want to make. Maybe you've put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ. I know I need him. I know I'm a sinner. I believe that he died for me, but you know that you are not living as a child of God. 
let me just encourage you. If you are living your life in disobedience to the word of the Lord, in rebellion, in compromise, the word of God is not what is inspiring you. It's your flesh, it's the world, the culture, the devil himself is what is inspiring you. I would encourage you, the Bible says, if you conceal your sin, you will not prosper. But whoever confesses their sin and forsakes it, leaves it behind, you will find mercy. And before you leave, don't race out. There's plenty of time to go get the kids. The worship team is going to sing a song. And I would encourage you, if you know that there is compromise and your life looks nothing like your Father God, confess it, let go of it, allow healing and refreshing and forgiveness and grace to come. You don't need to confess your sins to men. You confess your sin to God. He's the one that you've sinned against. Well, maybe you have sinned against a brother. If you have an odd against a brother, go and make peace. Maybe you need to go and ask someone for forgiveness because you've hurt them. You've been abusing them. You've been uh, stealing from them. You, I don't know. You've been lying to them. Yeah, you have offended your brother. Then go and make peace. But guys, life is too short. And Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back for a church that he wants pure, he wants holy, he wants lit up, being the light in this dark world, the oil in our lamps burning bright, because he's coming back. And I don't know when it's going to be, but it's imminent. And the church has believed in the doctrine of imminency since its beginning. They believe that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. We'll see that when we get to chapter 4 in this book. It's urgent. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. So many stories I hear. I, a gal here last night told me that uh, one of her clients, 37 years old, two young babies, went to bed this week and didn't wake up. Aneurysm. 37. Leaves behind two beautiful children and her husband. A funeral at the Omni for those, that family of three that was crushed under the 2,000 people at the Omni in La Costa this week. Just going to the beach, laying out a mom and her daughter and sister-in-law, wife of a dentist, young children. None of us know. Don't leave anything undone. And so as the worship team leads us in the song, Lord, search our hearts. Reveal if there be any wicked way in us, Lord, that we might confess it, that you might cleanse it, that we might walk in freedom. Lord, may your word, your inspired word, your God-breathed word, the living, active word in us light us up to be a light, to see this world turned upside down, Lord. I pray that we would know that none of us have been excused, no matter our age, under 40, over 40, kids, 85, whatever it might be. Lord, you desire for each and every one of us to speak the gospel, the good news. And so, Lord, direct and guide. The pastors will be available for prayer after the service. If any of you would like prayer, maybe you know that you aren't a believer and you want to become a believer and you just couldn't raise your hand, we're going to be here. We'd love to pray with you if that's your heart, your will, your desire. Let's all stand together.